Hey, what's up, Camp Heaps? Let's take a quick look at some questions that we worked through in class to hopefully help you find some success on our quiz and our test. So as you take a look at uh, this first set of questions, you're asked to draw three Lewis structures, and I'm going to do it in a way that I think is the most helpful when you're working through questions uh, or drawing Lewis structures that uh, are a little more complex. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to total up the number of valence electrons. Phosphorus has five, chlorine has seven, but there are five uh, chlorine atoms in this molecule. So there's 35 total from chlorine plus the five from phosphorus. It means I've got 40 electrons, 40 valence electrons to work with. And I always like to work with those in pairs. So I'm gonna divide by two to get 20 valence electron pairs to work with. Uh, once I have my total number of valence electron pairs, I set up my skeletal structure by putting one atom, the less electronegative one, in the middle and surround it by everything else. So in this case, it's going to be phosphorus surrounded by five chlorines. And then I'm going to connect them all with a pair. So in this case, that's going to take up five pairs. And then I'm going to subtract from my total pairs. I have 15 pairs left now. If I still have pairs left over, I'm going to put them around the terminal atoms first. And so in this case, I'm going to give each chlorine three additional pairs of valence electrons to complete their valence level. And then I'm going to subtract again. So in this case, 15 minus 15, I don't have any pairs left. Once I've used up all of my pairs, I'm going to check my structure. And as I look at this, I recognize that my Chlorines each have uh, an octet, a complete valence level, which is great. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned about phosphorus because as I look at phosphorus, right, phosphorus has uh, more than an octet. But uh, remember, I'm just going to look at my periodic table and confirm that phosphorus is in the third period or below, right? And if it is, then that means that it has access to the d orbitals and an expanded octet is possible. So PCL5. Awesome. Uh, TE, BR4, same idea, right? I'm going to start with calculating the total number of valence electrons that I have to work with. And for tellurium, uh, that's going to be six. Bromine is seven valence electrons, but uh, there's four. So I'm going to have 28 from the uh, bromine uh, plus the six from uh, tellurium, which is going to be a total of 34 valence electrons. Again, I'm going to divide by two to get 17 electron valence electron pairs. Uh, so that's always my first step. One central atom surrounded by everything else. In this case, it's going to be four bromine atoms. I'm going to connect uh, them all with a single bond to start and subtract. That's going to leave me with 13 uh, pairs of electrons. Uh, again, if I have pairs left over, I'm going to put them around the terminal atoms first. Uh, again, I'm going to complete their uh, valence level. So each of them are going to get three pairs of electrons. This time, uh, however, I still have a pair left over. Uh, if I have a pair left over, after completing the valence level of the terminal atoms, I'm going to put it on the central, even if I feel like it might look a little weird or funny. Uh, just make sure that you follow that process every single time and you'll get the correct answer. Um, so I don't have any pairs left. I'm going to check my work. Uh, I noticed that my bromines each have a complete valence level, feeling really great about that. And the tellurium, again, even though uh, it has more than an octet. It is possible. It does have access to the d orbitals uh, because um, it's in the third period or below, meaning it has the third energy level or higher, and uh, therefore we do have d orbitals. Okay, lastly here with SF6, uh, we're going to do uh, the same thing, right? Sulfur has got six valence electrons. Fluorine has got seven, but there are uh, six fluorine atoms, so 42 coming from the fluorine uh, plus the six from the sulfur means I've got 48 valence electrons. Um, and if I divide by two, that means I've got 24 valence electron pairs to work with here. Sulfur is going central, surrounded by everything else. In this case, it is six fluorines. Connect them all with a pair. Boom, 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 and subtract. So I've got 18 pairs left. Uh, if I have pairs left over after that initial connection, again, always put them on the terminal atoms first. In this case, I'm going to give three pairs to each of the fluorine. Um, because there are six of them, I'm going to use up all of my 18 uh, remaining pairs. So 
no pairs left over. So let me check uh, my work. Um, I have my terminal fluorines each with an octet. They must have an octet. Uh, they can expand their octet. Um, and the sulfur, um, that central sulfur, even though it's got 12 electrons, that is possible with sulfur. Again, it's got uh, access to the d orbitals. Whew, so much work, and uh, we haven't even started answering the questions. Uh, there's going to be a lot of Lewis structure drawing here, even to answer questions that uh, you know aren't explicitly what is the Lewis structure. Um, so let's get to the questions now. Uh, we're asked to determine the molecular geometry of the three Lewis structures that we just drew. Uh, this takes some practice, right? You want to make sure that you're comfortable with the geometries of all the different types that you see um, on this Vesper chart in your booklet. Um, there are some new ones, especially with the five and six regions of electron density, so it does take some practice. I encourage you to maybe use the Vesper simulation that you have uh, linked on our um, uh, what happened today sheet to kind of help you out if you're stuck. So if I build my PCL5 uh, molecule, it's a central atom single bonded to five uh, terminal atoms. And uh, the nice thing about this simulation, right, is that it is going to give you uh, what the molecular geometry, electron geometry, and the bond angles are, which can be checked and unchecked. So, you know, you can kind of test yourself, test your knowledge. Again, I encourage you to think about uh, shape that is familiar to you with five regions. What I like to think about is a ballerina uh, on their tiptoes, right? Kind of holding um, an atom at their feet and one above their head. And then the equatorial atoms, there are three of them, kind of make up their tutu. And this is what I think of when I think of any molecule that's got five regions of electron density. And, you know, it does just take some practice, but you want to be thinking about, uh, you know, what shape does that make? And uh, the top makes a three-sided pyramid, and that uh, shape on the bottom is also a three-sided pyramid. So we have a trigonal bipyramidal, or essentially two three-sided pyramids, and the electron geometry is the same because they're all bonded region. So I know it's just asking us about the molecular geometry, but, uh, you know, important thing about both of them. So we know that PCL3 is going to be trigonal bipyramidal. So that's going to narrow down some of our answer choices. Uh, we know it's going to be C or D for the geometries. Um, and then as we um, move on and think about the, um, the second molecule, right, the TEBR4, it's got five regions of electron density, but one of those regions is a lone pair region. So if I think about kind of how this works, it's still the ballerina in terms of the electrons, right? So the electron geometry notice is still trigonal bipyramidal. Um, when I think of five regions, I like to think of uh, ballerina with an ugly 2-2, two -two, right? So I'm going to remove from the 2-2 two -two first, right? And so notice... I've removed that and replaced it with a lone pair region, which is still going to affect the shape, right? And so when you think about, well, what shape is this? Just imagine taking that ballerina, maybe kind of tilting it on the side, right? And I think it becomes very clear, or a little more clear, right, that we're talking about um, essentially a, a seesaw shape with the molecular geometry, right? Uh, I don't even know if they have seesaws anymore. I think they're dangerous now. I don't know. Uh, but you know, the shape of the molecule is uh, what we call the seesaw shape. So if you have gotten those two, right, it kind of gives away the answer, right? We recognize that D is the correct answer, but, you know, coming back to this, if you want to build it or if you want to practice with this, right, notice that now we've got six regions of electron density um, and therefore the shape is octahedral. Again, with six regions, I like to think of still the ballerina, um, but now it's a ballerina with a beautiful or a, a pretty tutu, right? Um, and it's beautiful because it has not just three prongs, but now it's got four. Um, so again, take some practice. Um, it's a lot uh, to take in, but I encourage you to think about maybe using a shape 
um, or referencing the shape of something that you uh, already know uh, what it looks like. And, you know, I think that kind of helps when it comes to uh, kind of taking in this entire sheet of shapes and bond angles. Okay, moving on. Uh, if you take a look now at our next question, uh, we're taking a look at identifying which of them has a zero dipole moment. This is code for non-polar, right? So zero dipole means zero dipole moment means non-polar. You might also uh, read what has a net dipole moment. That means overall is a dipole, or overall is polar. Right, so we're asked basically which of these is uh, nonpolar. So again, um, as you think about doing this, um, you don't have the simulation for the shapes, so you do want to get comfortable, kind of just looking at the Lewis structure you've drawn, and you know how many regions of electron density around the central atom, right, and use that to kind of hone in on what it is or where you're going to be working with the shapes, right? And then how many of those regions are bonding regions? How many are lone pair regions? So you don't have the simulation, but, you know, kind of in your mind, work the simulation, if you will. Uh, here, when you're trying to identify which has, uh, which is nonpolar, again, uh, it's helpful to work with or start with the simulation if you're unsure, kind of translating, um, these molecules in your brain, and it does take some practice, but if we have uh, a zero dipole or a nonpolar molecule, that means that the bond dipoles are going to cancel out. Um, and so even though the individual bond may be polar, right? We see here chlorine is more electronegative than phosphorus. Even though this bond is polar, it's got an atom, an identical chlorine pulling in the opposite direction, right? So this is 90 degrees and 90 degrees, where they're pulling 180 degrees away from one another. So those dipoles cancel out and they leave a symmetry to the molecule, right? Same thing right now, if you imagine that I was looking at uh, the ballerina sort of floating above the ballerina's head uh, from the top and looking from the top down, and these are the like little prongs of the tutu right? Uh, this is a polar bond. And so there is a bond dipole, but they are each pulling at 120 degrees from one another. And so they cancel out. So there's no net dipole on this uh, molecule of PCl5, right? In the TeBr4, where one of those um, regions has been replaced with a uh, uh, bonding region, right? Again, think about pulling it from the from the tutu, if you will, right? Because it's an ugly tutu. Um, if you think about this, we create some asymmetry. This lone pair creates an asymmetrical molecule. Um, or if I were to like cut this right down the middle, right, one side is not going to look like the other side. Um, and in this case, right, the bond dipoles are not going to cancel out right? These di di dipoles might cancel out a little bit, right? Mm. But if I think about that idea of looking at it from the top, you know, these dipoles don't have an atom over here to kind of cancel them out. And so it's going to create a region uh, of partial charge, uh, partial positive, partial negative region. So um, as you look at your molecules, right, um, you're thinking about is the molecule symmetrical, right? Do the bond dipoles cancel out? And if they do, then it's a nonpolar molecule. And we see that happen um, with uh, PCL5 and SF6. Both of those will have the bond dipoles cancel out. Um, they will have what we say is a zero dipole moment. Um, the TeBr4, however, would have a net dipole um, or be polar. So in this case, we're looking at just PCL5 and SF6 as the nonpolar or have a zero dipole moment. Uh, okay, bond angles for TeBr4. Um, this one is, uh, again, a molecule that's got five regions of electron density. One of the regions has been removed, right? And again, think of it as a ballerina, but I've removed 
one of the prongs of its tutu, right? Now, you've got this great simulation that you can, yes, think about the bond angles. And this one's going to lie to you a little bit, but I want to start with, uh, let's imagine they were all bonded regions, right? I'm going to draw my ballerina here really quick. And uh, you've got a couple of angles to be thinking about, right? You've got what are known as uh, the axial angles, right? So imagine North Pole, South Pole, right? And so if I go from the atom that the ballerina is holding in uh, their fingers, right, down to their core and out to the tutu, that makes a 90 degree angle. Um, if I have a uh, similar measurement from the South Pole or their feet up to their core out to the tutu, that's again a 90 degree angle. So the axial angles are 90 degrees. Um, and then we have uh, what are called the equatorial angles. And that's essentially the angles around the tutu, right? So imagine the tutu is like the equator. There we go. So now I'm floating above and looking down, right? Imagine this is the, the tutu with the three prongs, right? Uh, the equatorial angles, like from that Two two into the core, back out to the two two, right? So that's 120 degrees. So with a molecule that has five regions of electron density, you've got two different bond angles. You've got 90 degrees axial, and then 120 degrees whoop, equatorial. Now the thing about this molecule is that one of those regions is a lone pair region. And a limitation of this simulation when you're building is it's not going to show you how a lone pair region repels a little more strongly than the bonded region. It's going to just pop back to 120. Um, but the reality is the lone pair is like repelling more strongly than uh, the bonded pair is repelling back right? Because there's no positive core here. It's like, we're free, let's repel, right? And so they're going to push a little more strongly. Um, and so in actuality, these this bond angle is crunched down a little bit because they're pushed a little further away. So it's actually less than 120. Um, and then similarly, right, when you think about the axial angles, that lone pair is pushing uh, a little bit more strongly, right, on those bonded uh, pairs of electrons. And so it's actually going to be a little less than uh, 90. Uh, it gets a little better if you look at some of the real molecules, um, right? So I'm not sure if we have a complementary one. Oh, yeah, we do. Uh, so notice, right, if we have, oh, no, that's six. There we go. Um, so notice how the bond angle here is a little less than 90. You don't need to know what it is. Uh, and it's a little less than or a lot less than 120 here. And you don't need to know what those new bond angles are, right? Uh, you just know that it's crunched down a little bit, right? So as you think about the answer to the bond angle question here, recognize that it's going to be uh, less than 120 around the equator and less than 90 around the axial uh, angles. Again, due to that lone pair. Uh, again, kind of tied in to that last question, it's creating an asymmetrical molecule, making it have a net dipole. Whew. Okay, uh, next question, which of the following molecules has the largest dipole moment? Uh, this is going to require you to draw out the Lewis structures um, and um, pick a molecule that first is polar. Carbon dioxide uh, is going to have a double bond between each of the oxygens and the central carbon atom. And therefore, even though this bond is polar and this bond is polar, because it's a linear molecule, uh, it's going to cancel those dipoles out and be symmetrical. So this is going to be zero dipole. Uh, or nonpolar. BF3 is one of those exceptions, right? Um, it's an exception that can have less than an octet, sort of like hydrogen can have less than an octet, boron can as well. And when you draw the BF3 molecule, 
uh, it ends up looking like this. And um, it's a trigonal planar. And therefore, the bond angles are 120 degrees. So even though the bonds themselves are very polar, they're going to cancel one another out and be nonpolar overall, uh, which leaves us with HBr and HCl, which are pretty easy molecules to draw because there are just two, right? So we've got HBr, two atoms, and we've got HCl, and they look very similar when you draw out the Lewis structure. And as you think about which one has the largest dipole, just recognize that even though they're both polar, HBr kind of has like, you know, a dipole, and I'm going to exaggerate this, but HCl is like a dipole, right? And, you know, how do I know that HCl is going to have the larger dipole moment? Chlorine is more electronegative than bromine. It's going to hog those electrons more. Um, and so even though both of them are going to have a slight negative region and a slight positive region, that's going to be more uh, apparent on the HCl molecule, more exaggerated on the HCl molecule than on the HBr. So we say it has a larger dipole moment. Um, the bond angle in NH3 is smaller or larger, we have to pick, than the bond angle in CH4 because, and then we have to justify. So as you think about uh, this one, you know, NH3 and CH4 are two tetrahedral electron geometry molecules. So their electron geometries are the same. The difference, right, is in NH3, one of those bonded regions has been replaced by a bonded pair or a lone pair region. And so notice what happens, right? Those lone pairs repel more strongly than the bonded pair regions. And so when they're all bonded regions, the angles are exactly 109.5 um, in the lone the NH3 with that lone pair, the lone pair, like, remember, is, like, repelling more strongly than the bonded electrons. And so it crunches the angle down to 107.8. You don't have to know that. You just know that the angle is smaller, right? So uh, in this question, we're talking about uh, recognizing that in NH3, the bond angle is going to be smaller, so this one or this one, uh, because the unshared pair of electrons on nitrogen is more repulsive to the bonded electron pairs. Um, so just be aware of that idea about lone pair repulsiveness compared to bonded pair repulsiveness. Uh, okay, number six, consider the molecule above, determine the molecular geometry at the carbon and oxygen atoms respectively. Okay, so oof, we've got a molecule here that has more than one central atom. Um, here, instead of using the simulation, I'm just going to show you how I would do this if I didn't have the simulation, right? So carbon has one, two, three, four regions of electron density. Um, those kind of like triangle and hash look mark looking things, they're just a way to try and make the molecule look like it's in three dimensions, right? So it's still just a single bond, but one's like going back into the paper and one's like coming out, but there's still four regions of electron density. And so if I don't have a simulation, what I need to be comfortable doing is recognizing that four regions of electron density are going to correspond to tetrahedral electron geometries, right? Now, the question is asking about molecular geometries, but notice that four regions of electron geometries, this is going to be tetrahedral, and then four regions of electron geometries are going to give me tetrahedral electron geometry bound the oxygen as well. But uh, here they're all bonded regions, right? So if I have four regions of electron density, the electron geometry is definitely tetrahedral, but if they're all bonded regions and no lone pair regions, then the molecule takes the same shape as the electron. So it's tetrahedral for uh, the molecular geometry about the central or about the carbon. Around the oxygen, right, two of those regions are uh, bonded regions and two are lone pair regions. So although the geometry of the electrons is still tetrahedral, the molecule itself, the atom is bent. Uh, and again, always come back to this if you find it helpful, especially when you're starting out, right? But I essentially have this going on uh, around the carbon where it's four bonded regions. And then on the around the oxygen, I essentially have this going on 
right? Where the oxygen is bonded to two things, but then I have two lone pairs of electrons. So although the molecule, or sorry, although the electrons are tetrahedral, the molecule itself is bent. So as I think about uh, this question, uh, you know, it takes practice. I wish that I had a better answer for you, but it just takes practice. And again, connecting it to shapes that you're more familiar with, I think is super helpful. Okay, question seven, the Lewis structure of water and carbon dioxide above. How do the molecular geometries and polarities of water and carbon dioxide compare? Here is one of the great questions that I think um, shows, I guess, the beauty of Lewis structures, but also their weaknesses, right? As you look at how these two are drawn, these are perfect Lewis structures. Yet, uh, it's deceptive because the molecules look linear, and yet not both of them are. Right. You have to recognize that with water, those lone pair regions that, you know, are drawn up, oops, are drawn above and below here are actually in a tetrahedral arrangement with the bonds. And that creates a bent shape. Right. And it's because the shape is bent that the molecule is asymmetrical. Uh, the bond types do not cancel and create a net dipole. So water is bent and a polar molecule. Uh, carbon dioxide, on the other hand, even though we have two atoms bonded to the central, just like we did in water, there are no lone pairs of electrons on the central atom. And so even though we have an individual bond dipole here and here, they are going to cancel one another out um, and make the molecule itself nonpolar. So as you think about this, um, we've got polar molecule of water, nonpolar molecule of carbon dioxide. Um, it's linear. So water is bent and polar, carbon dioxide is linear and nonpolar. So those lone pairs, they play an effect. They play a role on the shape. Okay, here we go. We're down to uh, the last three for today. Um, if you take a look at uh, hybridization, right? Uh, the key with hybridization is uh, really just recognizing the following things, right? So you've got three types of hybridization, SP, SP2, and SP3. And uh, we're talking about S orbitals and P orbitals, right? And when we're talking about SP hybridization, we're taking one S and one P orbital, right? Or total, we're mixing together two orbitals, right? And again, so kind of imagine one and one. They're not written there because they're ones, but two orbitals mixed together to get two hybrid orbitals. Um, so that's SP hybridization, right? SP2, we're taking one S and two P orbitals and making three, one S and two P uh, hybrids. So the one and the two P orbitals, right? And then finally with the SP3 hybridization, with the sp3 hybridization 1s and three of the p orbitals um, so we're mixing together four total orbitals here um, when we have sp3 hybridization so as you think about this uh, question and you try to identify um, you know what the hybridization of carbon in carbon dioxide is, the way that you use this is simply by looking at how many regions are around the atom uh, for which you're trying to determine the hybridization. So again, I have to draw out the Lewis structure. Um, you know, For molecules like carbon dioxide, you're gonna be doing it so much, you probably will be able just to do it from memory. Um, but notice that I have one, two regions of electron density around the carbon. Right. That's going to coincide or if you try to answer a question like this very quickly, recognize that it kind of corresponds to that two, uh, those two orbitals. Right. That I've mixed together. So the type of hybridization around the carbon is what we call SP hybridization. So two of the P orbitals remain unhybridized, but we take an S and a P and mix together to make two hybrid SP orbitals. Uh, you know, it's a little overwhelming. I know it's new. Right. But. As you think about this, just to give you some other context, right? If I had CH4, uh, this would be, or this would have, this carbon would have one, two, three, 
four regions of electron density. And so this would be sp3 hybridized, right? I know this is not part of the question. Um, and then sometimes you'll have, uh, I don't know, uh, I think we have something like this, right? Where we've got carbon maybe double bonded to an oxygen and then maybe, I don't know, I'm just making this up. And then we've got two hydrogens bonded there, right? And so as you think about what might we have here, right, as far as hybridization, well, we're going to have one, two, three regions. And so this would be sp2 hybridized, again, just corresponding to those numbers. So that's probably the easiest way to do it. Just look at the Lewis structure and uh, count how many regions of electron density. Okay, question nine and 10, you're gonna draw a Lewis structure that has multiple central atoms. It looks insane, uh, but you're gonna use this uh, and how it's given to you to help you build the structure, right? Normally when you look at a formula like this, let's see, there's one, two, three, four carbons. You might see C4, H2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, H, 8, O, right? You usually see it all together right? It's just like how many total there are. And they split it out like this to help you build or recognize how they're bonded together. So the key is to recognize hydrogen is going to form one bond, right? Oxygen is going to form two bonds. Uh, nitrogen, if you have it, is going to form three bonds. Um, and carbon, if you have it, is going to form four bonds. And, and just stick to that when you're working with these organic molecules, right? Um, so when I try to build this, carbon you know, you may not know at first, right? If I put the hydrogens, there's two hydrogens around the carbon. I know that the hydrogen has to be single bonded to the carbon. But if I put the hydrogens like this, then when I try to build off and put my next carbon on there, you know, I can't really connect it to this hydrogen. Um, so when you're building long chains or big organic molecules like this, um, it's generally going to be the carbons connected, making a chain of carbon. So the first one, put the hydrogen above and below and connect it and then do my second carbon and then I'll put it above but you can below here and connect it and then my third carbon I've got two hydrogens connect it with a single bond uh, and then my fourth carbon again two hydrogens and connect it uh, okay then I'm out of carbons let's let's look at this right the carbon has to have four bonds so if this first carbon already has two then I need to double bond it to my second carbon and if that's a double bond, then I have to single bond my second to my third, right, to make sure that uh, each of the carbons have four bonds. And then between the third and the fourth, right, that's going to require a single bond as well, making sure that each have uh, each of the carbons have four bonds. Um, now, the fourth one only has three, but we haven't done building this molecule. We've got an O and an H. And again, when you're first starting out, maybe you try to put the H there, but then it's like, ooh, where does the O go? So uh, I'm going to put the O bonded to my oxygen with a single bond. Uh, I'm not going to do a double bond here, right? I know that oxygen needs two bonds, but I'm just do a single bond because I also have an oxygen, or sorry, a hydrogen I need to finish off uh, and it needs to be single bonded. So when you're doing this, it's really difficult at first, um, but just remember this and it really comes together quite nicely. Uh, then of course, just remember to finish your oxygen. It does need a couple of lone pairs because oxygen does need to have an octet. And then uh, when it comes to identifying sigma bonds, remember that sigma bonds are, uh, or single bonds are sigma bonds, right? So each of these constitutes a sigma bond. And then a double bond is gonna be one sigma and one pi. And then it's just counting them up. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Sigma and one pi bond. Boop, there we go. And then finally, question 10, draw the Lewis structure. Boom, we did it already. What type of hybridization are exhibited by carbon in the molecule? Uh, so as I look at this, right, I am recognizing that I have one, two, three regions. Remember... That's going to be sp2 hybridized. So I've got some sp2 hybridization. Uh, same thing on this second carbon, one, two, three regions. So definitely some sp2. And then one, two, three, four regions. So sp3. And then one, two, three, four regions. So again, sp3. So we've got sp2 hybridization for the carbon, sp3 for hybridization for the carbon. Um, so just two and three. 
not part of this question, but if I wanted the hybridization of the oxygen, it's one, two, three, four regions as well. So this would also be sp3 hybridized for the oxygen. Lone pairs count as a region. Uh, not part of the question, but there you go. All right, hope that helps. Have a great day.